Thank you for joining us. You are a part of an elite group who recognizes that black women's health should be at the forefront of the national conversation. We are mothers, daughters, activists, entrepreneurs, entertainers, corporate warriors, and more, who help boost the economy and often drive the national conversation. For 38 years, the Black Women's Health Imperative has strived to amplify our voices, help enact policy that protects us, research our issues, create programs that enhance our lives, and produce events like this one to ensure we keep the conversation going about the issues that matter to us most. So, let's get started with our program. Good afternoon. I'm Melissa Harris Perry. I'm the Maya Angelou Presidential Chair at Wake Forest University, and I am your host for this hour. It should be a very powerful and impactful hour because it's the second hour of our conversation about suffering in silence, Black women and fibroids. This is part of the anniversary, the 38th anniversary of the Black women's health imperative. And over the course of this week, as you will see, there are so many panels, conversations, but maybe none more personal than this, as we try to think about and engage and do something about the realities of fibroids and the suffering that so many Black women have as a result of fibroids. Now, in this hour, we're going to have some great guests. A little later on, we're going to talk with Tanika Gray Valburn, who is founder of the White Dress Project, founded to promote awareness and recognition of fibroids. Also, a bit later, we're going to talk with Jenny Rosenberg, who is executive director of CARE about fibroids, which is a Washington, D.C. based nonprofit who's mission is really to elevate uterine fibroids as a women's health issue. But first, we're going to begin with a very, very special guest. We're going to have a little bit of a one-on-one -on -one fireside chat, even though I don't have a fire with me, um, with Cynthia Bailey. Cynthia Bailey is an entrepreneur. She's a model. She's a TV personality. And of course, you probably recognize her from The Real Housewives of Atlanta. What you may or may not know is that she is also a survivor of the experience and the reality and the difficulties of fibroids. Cynthia, are you with yes. us? Hi. Hi, Melissa. Can you guys hear me? I think uh, you guys could hear me before. Uh, it doesn't look like I'm muted. Can you guys see me and just can't? So move? I'm not sure if I'm the one who's not in or <laughs> if the problem is simply my connection here. So I'm going to do just the worst thing ever, but I'm going to pop out and come back in. my life in a big way. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to get to that. Are you back, Melissa? Yeah. <laughs> can you see? <laughs> I can see it here now. I went away. I really apologize. Who knows? The world is weird. So I, I, I greatly apologize. I was not wanting to not hear, but I wanted, I really just wanted you to start by telling your story. I hope maybe you got started while I was gone. Well, I kind of did. I was, I was set up, but I was waiting for you to come back. I didn't want you to miss anything. But, so, yeah, tell us your story. All right, so so this is my story. I the first time I I even heard of fibroids was when I was pregnant. They told me that when I was pregnant with Noel, I had a fibroid um, inside of me. So I was like, okay, what does that mean? I didn't know. Am I dying? What is that? What is this thing? So no big deal. It went away or whatever. I thought it went away, but the way fibroids work usually 
usually they just kind of grow. They kind of linger, they grow, they get bigger. And sometimes they're not a problem. Some, sometimes they are. For me, it ended up being a huge issue for me just in terms of just having, I don't know how transparent we can be on here, but I'm just going to keep it 100 because that's what I do. Super, super, super heavy periods. Uh, I was anemic. Uh, I was exhausted all the time because of being anemic. Uh, I felt like I was on my period at least two weeks out of the month, which really sucks, as you guys know, as a woman, like it's just a lot. So I think the turning point for me was I remember being out of town working, doing some stuff for Bravo and I was on my period. And I talk about the story a lot because this was really when I just decided I had to do something about my situation. Uh, I was doing a Bravo event. I was like doing a meet and greet signing all day. Uh, I didn't have a lot of time to monitor and keep going back, changing pads and stuff. So anyway, I remember sitting down and standing up. I was sitting down, I stood up and all of a sudden I just felt like a whoosh just went down my dress. Well, it did. Basically, I started to bleed like in front of fans and people. And it wasn't like, I mean, I was like, I was like, if I stand still, is anyone going to notice if I try to walk? And at that point, my now ex-husband just was like, we'll be right back. And literally, there was like a trail of blood from where I walked from to the elevator, bled in the elevator. People were trying to come on the elevator. I was sitting there bleeding. They didn't even think to look down. They were just like, oh, Cynthia, can I get a picture? And I was mortified. My ex-husband was mortified, embarrassed. I make it to the room and I just was like, this is crazy. How can I live like this? This is too much. So uh, one of, I have a couple of proud moments on the show, but my fibroid story is one of them. Because I was dealing with this in real life, I felt like it was important to talk about it on the show. Yeah. Women don't like to talk about fibroids. Mm -hmm. Their men don't like to talk about the women having fibroids. It's, it just wasn't a conversation that women talked about because it's kind of embarrassing to just be bleeding all over the place and just going through this issue. So with that said, at the time, our producers were like, well, you know, we don't really know if that's going to be good TV or people care or whatever. And I really fought <laughs> for them to film me getting the, I ended up getting the um, UFE, uterine fibroid embolization um, procedure. And I really fought for them to film that and make us talk about that because it affects so many women. It's like, as soon as I started talking about it, I felt like every woman in the world was dealing with fibroids. And I felt so alone at the time until I started talking about it. Exactly. And I became, you know, I pretty much became the fibroid lady. Like people, <laughs> go, <laughs> people come up to me everywhere I go and they're like, oh my God, I yep. had, you know, my fibers removed because of you. You know, I never talked about it. I was, they were even hiding it from their husbands and stuff. And then it became a conversation they felt like they could have with their husbands and their husbands supported them because, I mean, it affected everything. It affected my sex life. It affected everything because I was bleeding all the time. I didn't have time to do anything else. So thank God uh, I won the the um, debate with my producers and they decided to air it. And it was one of the best things that I've ever shown on the show because it really inspired and changed the way women and just people looked at fibroids and it was just a real conversation and to be quite honest half of the cast most of the cast of the real housewives of Atlanta's of Atlanta have dealt with fibroids as well I mean they just chose not to really talk about on the show but they do they do they have dealt with them and you know they're always a who what doctor did you go to it's it's a real thing and it's a conversation that we should be having because it's sad to just feel alone and suffer in silence and deal with this because it really does affect every aspect of your life if it's out of control. There's different levels of how people, you know, for me, it was like, I, I work, I'm an entrepreneur. All I do is work. So I don't have time to fight. <laughs> <I don't. laughs> so that's my story. And if you guys didn't see that episode, it was a pretty powerful episode. I really took you guys right in there with me. And if you haven't had UFE, and if you're thinking about it, I highly recommend it. It definitely took me from having a period that lasted from two weeks to like three or four days. Mm -hmm. I so appreciate you telling and I'm nodding in agreement as I talked a little bit in the last hour. Um, 12 years ago, I've been fighting fibroids for four years before that. And, and 12 years ago, I had a hysterectomy in mm -hmm. 
response to what was going on with me. But those stories of like bleeding, especially in a professional setting. So I, for me, like, so if your moment is that moment walking in the trail and the um, elevator, for me, that moment was actually the night that um, uh, it, it was, I don't know, it was one of the election nights and I'm sitting there on set and I sent a text to my friend and was like, if you don't see me after the commercial, call, you know, the EMTs because I'm losing so much blood sitting here, I might pass out in the bathroom. But I didn't want to stand up because, you know, you're on TV and you don't want your, you know, the folks sitting next to you to know. So mm -hmm. I was just trying to sit there and manage it. And every time I, I talk to women who have had this experience, all of us have that moment. We have that one moment when it was like, okay, this is officially too ridiculous to go on. Exactly. Exactly. That was definitely the turning point for me. And I knew I had to do something about it. And I've been... Uh, much happier ever since. I mean, I even kind of dealt with, I don't like to play with the word depression, but it's, you know, I was definitely down because I just never really felt that great, yep. honestly, when I was dealing with it. But you can't really be bleeding to death all month and feel good. Like it's, you know, it, it makes sense that it makes us feel awful. Stick yeah. with us. I'm gonna, I want to bring in two other folks. I want to bring in Tanika Gray Valborn, who is founder of the White Dress Project. And given the stories we've just been telling, I think it makes perfect sense why a fibroid project would be the White Dress Project, because you sure don't wear white dresses while you're dealing with fibroids. And also Jenny Rosenberg, again, executive director care about fibroids. So um, let me start with you, Tanika. You heard the two of us, you know, yammering about bleeding to death just while walking around. Um, right. Talk to us about the White Dress Project and your goal to do, I think, what we just heard Cynthia say, to make sure that we're not alone in this, that we're not feeling like we're the only ones, or that we have to be ashamed of it, as though it's some kind of failing of our womanhood. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Melissa, for having me. Thank you to Black Women's Health Imperative. I'm so happy to be here with two of my friends, Cynthia and Jenny, um, to talk about this. Hi, Cynthia. It's so good to see you. Um, this is such an important topic, as you mentioned, Melissa. Um, Cynthia and I have done a lot of work together around talking about this issue, um, eliminating the stigma around this issue and, uh, and making this uh, issue that is no longer taboo. Mm -hmm. At the White Dress Project, that is our mission. We want women to understand that they do not have to suffer in silence with fibroids. And when women like you and when women like Cynthia who have a celebrity status, who have influence, speak about their experiences, it helps our community so much. Because, you know, sometimes- I'm sure Cynthia is the only one here with celebrity status. We might have both had five boys. <laughs> <laughs> Stop well, it. no, Melissa, no. In, in in my world, you are a veteran journalist. I'm a journalist as well. You hang with a lot of nerds. That's incredible. <laughs> so we <laughs> applaud you. <laughs> um, but it's it's just wonderful that you know we have these forums that we can talk about it, where we can share these experiences because a lot of times women just feel so alone and they feel like they're suffering in silence. And as Cynthia mentioned, you know, we kind of just keep going. We keep it pushing, we keep it moving. And we have really normalized heavy bleeding. We've normalized the pain. So therefore women aren't talking about it. So after my first surgery, I really wanted to make sure that we had a forum and a community and a support system so that women understand that this is not normal we do not have to suffer in silence with this. And if this were something that men were going through, we'd be talking about it all the time, trying to find uh, uh, solutions, legislation, funding, commercials, marketing, like it would all happen. Um, so I'm on a mission to make sure that we do that and, and, and we have done that with the White Dress Project. Mm -hmm. So Jenny, I want to come to you on this. I love that the three of you all are already co-conspirators on women's health issues and have already been actively working around these questions. So Jenny, talk to us about some of the public policy side, because it's not just that we feel alone. A lot of times we are alone. There isn't the kind of policy support, um, like we were just hearing that idea that it would be everywhere if men were experiencing this. 
Thank you, Melissa. And uh, thank you to the Black Women's Health Imperative and to be on this esteemed panel with my good friend, Tanika. And I'm a huge fan both of yours, Cynthia, and of you, Melissa. And it's just great to have this conversation and for women to be speaking out about this issue. And like everybody has said already, it, is become, it, it has been the norm for women to suffer in silence and for women to accept that there has been more funding and more research for men's health causes. And there hasn't been more of a voice for this, this cause, for this issue, this condition that impacts millions and millions of women. And as Cynthia said, when I told girlfriends of mine that I've known for years and years that I was working on this issue, I had no idea that they had had fibroids because it is the story of suffering and silence. And every one, every woman I talk to has a story of the the bleeding and the the shame and the embarrassment. And that shouldn't be the way that women feel about any health issue, especially one that is just that can be so debilitating. And so our mission at Care About Fibroids is to empower women to educate Washington, D.C., the policymakers and the, the people on Capitol Hill and at agencies and departments who are in charge of research dollars to put them toward uterine fibroids research and to also encourage innovation in the pharmaceutical industry so that there are myriad options for women so that it's just not one or the other where you're either suffering or you're getting a hysterectomy or you have to do so much research to find out that there are options in the middle. And often women you know, will tell me they feel very intimidated when they go into the doctor's office because first they're dealing with the shame of this or they're dealing just with, with the overwhelming effect of having fibroids. And so what we've done on our website is we've actually created a one pager that women can take into the doctor's office. So that when you're sitting there, we've all been there, you know, the doctor's looking at you and you have so much to say and, you know, they're moving very quickly and it's, here's your checklist. So we are very excited about that. And then all the, the resources we have on our website. And then recently uh, we've partnered with Responsum Health to create an app for women in an com online community. And Tanika is part of this as well. Um, so that women have, can go online, they are on their app and immediately have a community information, updated news feed about um, research and innovation in fibroids, but also a way to kind of keep up with their own symptoms, keep a log so that it is right there when they go into the doctor's office. Because again, um, it's about empowering women. So I, I so appreciate that. I love that idea of self-advocacy. And Cynthia, I want to come to you on this because one of the things you mentioned as part of your story is that you were pregnant with the first time that you heard the word fibroids and first realized that that was going to be part of your journey. My daughter, my eldest daughter was four years old when I had um, the hysterectomy and she has distinct memories of like me eating ice all the time in her childhood. She has, right, that's the, that iron deficiency. She remembers um, like us going to Disney and I couldn't get on the rides because I had been told not to. Now she's 18 years old and it's important to me to, um, to really help her be an advocate for her own health. And all the women who didn't talk to us, mm -hmm. how do you or do you talk to your daughter um, and to like the daughters in our community mm -hmm. about the fibroid experience? How can we help them to be those self-advocates? Well, I think first and foremost, just, you know, being honest about, you know, the, the issue, the situation. I didn't grow up with a mom who felt comfortable talking to me about anything personal. I didn't get sex talk. I didn't get period talk. I mean, I basically, once I started my period, she was like, okay, now you're going to go on birth control because now you can actually get pregnant. And I don't even know if you're having sex, but I know you will not be getting pregnant. So you take this pill every day until, you know, you're old enough to get off of it, I guess, or whatever. Yeah. And um, there was just no real um, connection just in terms of, us being able to talk about our bodies and just what we were feeling and what we were going through. Um, I definitely made sure I broke that cycle with my daughter and anyone else that has any time to listen to me <laughs> go on and on about fibroids. Um, just because I just want 
to make sure that anything um, Noelle is dealing with, that she feels comfortable getting information from me and, and not feeling, you know, ashamed or uh, afraid to talk to me about it, you know, because I don't know, you know, we deal with a lot of stuff as women. We just deal with a lot of things. And I think the most powerful thing that we can do is talk to each other and support each other and have each other's backs. And I feel like that's what I need to just continue to do. And that's what I do with Noel and anybody else again that has time that wants to hear my five work. <laughs> so it, it's so interesting to hear you say, you know, that story about your mom. Cause I think that's like lots of moms, but maybe particularly Southern moms are like, look, we're just gonna handle these things, but we're not necessarily gonna talk to you about them. And and so I, I also just gonna have a question for you, Abby, when I'm thinking about the other like folks I know who get real squirmy when you have a conversation like this, I can imagine the DC lawmakers are like, oh my God, please do not tell me about the lady parts and the things that happen around the lady parts. So how do you like get the guys to pay attention and listen? Yeah, so I, I one approach <laughs> is to bring it home for them, right? To say, you know, your daughter could have this, your sister could have this. Your wife could have this. And maybe, you know, that has led to other conversations in the home. Maybe this is why she's tried to talk to you about other things and, and it hasn't come out. So making it personal for them has really worked. I will be honest that in the very beginning when I started the organization, uh, we had a, uh, I don't know, I guess I'll call it just a disappointing moment when I spoke to a legislator and he told me that you know, he didn't really think that this initiative would be successful unless I looped it in with uterine cancer. Mm -hmm. And I guess his standard of what's important, you know, was determined by whether if it, if it was a tumor or something that could cause death. And I would argue obviously that we shouldn't have to have the standard of death for this to be an important issue. And I would also argue that the invasive treatments, the amount of blood you, you lose, the mental health component, all of those are extremely traumatic yep. and cause for us to be having this conversation. So to answer your question, I make it personal for them. I talk to them about addressing this with their daughters and what their daughters may be going through, what their wives may be going through. And usually that has some impact. Mm -hmm. Jenny, let me come to you. I know you have to pop out around 3.30, but I want to make sure I get you in on, on, on at least one more on this. So yeah. I, I think this point, we're hearing about the idea of how tough it is to talk to the boy legislators. Mm -hmm. Thanks for this, we have women, and we have black women legislators like Yvette mm -hmm. Clark on the Hill. So mm -hmm. what are the legislative actions currently kind of in place um, mm -hmm. that, um, that are the things we might be able to get some activism and as John Lewis would say, good trouble? Around. That's right. That's right. Good trouble. Um, so great news today. Uh, Senator Kamala Harris introduced legislation to push for more research and funding for uterine fibroids. And that is a huge step forward. But what I will tell you is that the community has to step up and make sure that that there are more senators to support her bill and to make sure it gets through the Senate, to make sure that there's companion legislation in the House and that we have a champion in the White House for women's causes who will sign the legislation into law. Um, you know, and so that's why it is so important for women not only to think about, there's so many factors that women take into account when they choose who they're voting for, but they have to remember too that we have to find leaders who are for women's health and will put weight behind issues that will help women move forward. Um, I would just add to what Tanika said. Last year, we had a fantastic briefing on Capitol Hill for staff. In addition to talking about the mental, toll, mental health toll, the sexual emotional toll, we also talked about the economic impact of this. And as Cynthia was saying, she's an entrepreneur. And when this takes her away from her business, that is a competitive issue. It's, you know, it directly impacts her pocketbook. It impacts everything that she does. And just think of all the women who are going through that, but also those women who may not be able to take time off from work, may not have a supportive spouse, may not have, you know, the infrastructure to to deal with it in the way that others do. And so that is something that we've also really stressed on Capitol Hill is that 
when women are not able to go to work, that has a direct impact on their, their livelihood, their children's livelihood and all of their dependents. And then also it always, you know, it, it reaches uh, Capitol Hill when you talk about industry. And so when women can't get to work, they're not being productive. So, uh, so that's, a, you know, a few things that we take into account, but I just want to punctuate this with women must be their best advocate. We all have to, you know, make sure that we support Senator Harris and that we're doing that when we go and vote in November, we're making sure that the people who we're voting for represent women's health and women's causes. Absolutely. I love it. Jenny's like, vote with your uterus, like literally. Well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Jenny, I know you have to run. I really appreciate it. Thank you time. all so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Oh, thank you. Bye, Jenny. So while we're here, I want to go to the white dress one more time. And I want to go to it because so much of what we talked about, what we've been talking about around the shame, the, the stress, all of that, those are things that women for decades felt about breast cancer. No one said the word breast in public. Nobody would talk about touching your breast once, once a month to keep it healthy. Right. And then there was a huge public movement to pink everything, right? And suddenly... It didn't, it was no longer a thing where if you got breast cancer, you didn't tell your children or your neighbor. You absolutely told them. And then you went on Facebook and you got support and love to fight it. So what is it that we need in order to have our pink ribbon, in order to have our white dress? Is it because breast cancer is the killer cancer in the way that you were talking about that congressperson? Is it something about us just like breaking through something? I just sort of got interested in how you see us being able to get to that moment. Yeah, well, we are well on our way. I We're so excited today by the legislation that Senator Harris has introduced on the Senate side and then um, Senator Congresswoman Clark introducing on the House side, which is the Uterine Fibroid Education and Research Awareness Act of 2020. So I'm, I'm so excited about that because we are well on our way. But you're so right, Melissa. Like, there was a time when people would not talk about breast cancer at all. They wouldn't talk about lupus at all. Um, mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden we saw football players wearing pink cleats. Mm -hmm. So I think it does have to be um, good storytelling as a journalist. Like I know that it, it takes good storytelling, it takes funding mm -hmm. and it takes good marketing, right? And with more people with influence like Cynthia speaking up about it, then it doesn't become this taboo topic. And that's what we really need to shift to, that 50% of the population is bleeding. 80% of black women are suffering from uterine fibroids. So we're not alone, ladies. So we really need to shift the conversation. There are so many women that DMS and talk about, you know, wanting to share their story, but not wanting to do it publicly. Mm -hmm. And this is not to shame any woman who is not at the place where they want to speak publicly about it. But I think culturally, we have just been um, given that mandate that we just don't talk about issues below the belt. Mm -hmm. And that's at the White Just Project, that's what we try to release. So I do believe that we will have our white ribbon, we will be wearing our white dresses on Capitol Hill, we'll be marching around the mall and, and doing things that, that let women know that they are not alone. This will be a national conversation. We're here talking with you. I'm here talking with you and Cynthia Bailey. Like for me, I continue to see how this movement is growing and strong. This month, July, Fibroid Awareness Month, this was legislation that our organization authored. So mm -hmm. now to hear everyone, you know, Fibroid Awareness Month rolling off of their tongue, it, it makes my heart flutter because I know that our organization put in so much work mm -hmm. um, to make sure that this legislation happened. So today, you know, five years since we did that, today now to get Senator Harris introducing this bill, like you have to understand my joy in knowing that women, our voices are being heard, they're strong, and we'll continue to converse about it. This is also just like, I, I mean, I feel like now I'm gonna have to tape this and show it in like Political Science 101. Cause I yes. don't quite know how, how, like, how a bill becomes a law or how an yes. idea 
becomes a bill. So to hear that five years ago, right, you have a nonprofit community-based black woman-led organization that actually authors the legislation. And again, I think I don't, many people don't realize how much legislation initiates in that kind of space, right? So bringing it to the lawmakers who are very busy and have a lot going on, but making sure. So we've got Yvette Clark, um, pushing from New York um, on the House side, right? Because you need the House, but it's bicameral. So you need the Senate. So you've got Senator Harris moving it here, right? On the on the Senate side. But then, and I don't want to miss this, but then I think, Cynthia, you're so right when you talk about a kind of turning point moment that happens when you're willing to share it on the platform that is RHOA. Because a platform like that reaches, so, I mean, I have to tell you, Earlier, I'm, I'm like in my kitchen and I said, okay, one of my guests is from Real Housewives. And so my my 18 year old daughter was like, oh, okay, which one? And she just starts going through and I was like, oh. right? Like she just knew all the things, right? So she's right. been teached on all these multiple levels that like lawmakers as wonderful as they are don't reach and community-based organizations as wonderful as they are often don't reach. So I hear you saying something you had to fight your producers. Mm -hmm. But did you ever have to fight yourself? Was there a moment, you're telling me lots of other housewives have had the fibroids, of course. Did you ever have to fight with yourself to go ahead and be vulnerable vulnerable enough to tell this part of your story? I, I felt like, honestly, I had kept it to myself for so long mm -hmm. that once I had the platform of the housewives, you know, as a reality star, it's just, great TV for me to really show you my real reality. And this is something that I was really dealing with. And, you know, the Real Housewives of Atlanta really started off, you know, you know, the focus is women, other women and, and primarily black women. Although, you know, we are the number one show on Bravo <laughs> and our fan base goes way beyond just us. As a black woman, I still, you know, primarily speak to my sisters out there because I heard for a long time that really, you know, we were the ones that really dealt with this issue the most. Now, as people are open up, have opened up about it, I talk to women of all races that deal with fibroids. Mm -hmm. And um, it really is just a conversation that just needs to keep going no matter what. And just going back to what Jenna was saying, like for me, I felt like I almost kind of had to really talk about it on the show because when you say you have the flu or whatever, whatever, you know, no one expects you to come to work. If you say, oh, I'm bleeding really heavy because I have these fibroids, they don't even know what you're talking about. They're like, we don't know what that is, girl. Put on a tampon and keep it moving. Like, we don't care because we don't understand. We don't have the education or the compassion for what you're going through because, to their knowledge, it's not really affecting them. But actually, you know, the, the woman in the house that's dealing with this is a much better person to be around, the kids and the husband. Oh. It, they know what's going on as opposed to us just having to deal with it on our own. So I said all that to say, having fibroids, I never felt like it was a good enough reason to miss work mm -hmm. just because I was working. And um, yeah. so the more we have those conversations, the more people understand really what we're going through because, you know, day one of your cycle, when you, are dealing with fibroids, like you, you literally, it, it's like having the flu. Like you just are not mentally or physically in a space where you want to go and make great reality TV because you just are a hot mess. So I, again, am so glad that I have this platform to really speak about things that we're not comfortable talking about. You know, I actually am surprisingly comfortable having uncomfortable conversations at this point because, you know, I've been on the show for so long now, I pretty much will say anything <laughs> where I kind of have to anything hold back sometimes. But I, I think it was important for me to really just lay it out and and not be prim and proper about it. Hey, I'm bleeding all over Atlanta down here. OK, I, you know, this is a real situation and I know I cannot be alone with this. Where are my other sisters that are out here bleeding with me? Yep. I, I so appreciate that. Um, I've got a couple of questions coming in from the audience. So I want to, I want to lay them out there. Um, and we don't have a medical doctor on, um, you know, sort of on this particular part of the call, but I still want to be sure we respond to this because somebody's asking how either having fibroids or 
having them surgically removed might impact fertility, might impact their ability to get pregnant later. And obviously, anytime we're, we start talking about your uterus, um, I think that that's a crucial question. I had my hysterectomy at 34, um, knowing that I was giving up the opportunity of ever being pregnant again, although I have a six-year-old, so that'll tell you, you can still have babies, but just not be pregnant again. So I'm interested in um, in what you all would respond about how to weigh and balance those questions. So this, this topic is really, really um, personal for me. It's hard for me. It's hard for a lot of women who are dealing with fertility issues. So I have had two myomectomies. I have had... Um, the bikini cut is what they call it, where, you know, very similar to a C-section. And then my second myomectomy was through my belly button. So it was a little bit less invasive, but still, you're still up in my uterus, right? You're still touching around. And I'm gonna share this very personal thing, but just this week, um, I got a, a negative uh, pregnancy test. Right, and I so let me just. I'm so sorry, and that that is real, and you are allowed to feel however much grief. There's no rules around that. I'm very very sorry to hear that. Thank you, and you know I said to myself when I was coming on here today, I said that I was not going to share that. Mm -hmm. And while I heard Cynthia talking, um, and then you brought up the question, I said to myself, like I'm doing the very thing that I'm asking women not to do so that we are not continually, continuously stifled and burdened with something on our, on our own and, and not being able to converse about it. Um, so yeah, this week has been very hard for me. Um, because I think about uh, these quote unquote benign tumors that I have had to have removed twice, which has subsequently caused scarring, caused my uterus to, I guess, be less intact mm -hmm. and therefore has currently caused my situation. My heart's desire is to be a mother. And I know that there are multiple ways to do so. Um, but sometimes when you're going through the situation and you you want it on your own, you don't really want to hear about other ways. Um, so I, like you alluded to, I'm not a doctor. Anyone watching this, The White Dress Project, we can connect you to our advisory council of doctors who can speak more eloquently to fibroids and fertility. I just know my personal situation is real as in two days ago. And the, the explanation that was given to me was that, um, you know, there's just something going on in your uterus that we're not able to combat. Mm -hmm. But I do know that I'll be a mother. Haven't quite figured out how yet, but I do know. So to answer your question, Melissa, yes, there is an impact on fibro with fibroids and fertility, and I've experienced it personally. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being brave enough to share. I know for sure you are not alone. And so I know for sure that your story, what you just shared, I know that there are dozens, hundreds, thousands of women who are going to see themselves in you. That does not make it easier to get the negative test, but I hope that it makes it easier to bear the pain of, of telling. Mm -hmm. Cynthia, do you wanna come in here? Um, yeah, I just was listening to Tanika and, um, Fortunately for me, you know, what the things that she's sharing isn't a part of my fiber journey. You know, I have one daughter. I wasn't really interested in having more kids, so it didn't really affect me that way. But I have so many, so many of my girlfriends that were trying, that are and were trying to have children that struggled in the same way. And it just, you know, it, it just, it just really sucks because you know, be, being, a, being a mother is like, I think one of the most amazing things that we were put on this planet to do and to have something such as fibroids get in the way of that is, is, is a, 
it, it's a catastrophe, like it really is. And, and this is why this is so important for us to have these conversations to, to just keep, you know, getting information out there, how, how many women really do suffer one way or the other. Everyone has their own pain. Everyone has their own journey, their, their own story. But at the end of the day, I just think, you know, it's just about us just trying to figure out how to make it better for, for the women that's coming behind us. Like we just have to be the ones to put our stories and our experiences out there and just keep this conversation going because it really is important. And and just as a, another, a mom and a mother, my heart really goes out to you, Tamika, because I know that you have, this has been a part of your journey for a while and I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you that um, God willing, you know, you do become a mom, however, whatever that looks like, however you accomplish that. Right. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just, I'm sitting here thinking about, again, when we're talking about how we talk to our daughter, Cynthia, about, mm -hmm. and how we model for them being open and, and talking about all of these questions when it sometimes wasn't modeled for us. And I think about like all the aunties in the community who never bore children and we don't necessarily know why, right? Maybe they were um, in marriages, maybe they weren't in marriages, but I just think of like all the aunties and church mamas in my life, right? Mm -hmm. And they were they were so maternal, right, to me, but didn't have their own kids. But you know, when you're a kid, you don't you don't wonder what some old lady's going through, right? And an old lady is anybody 24 or above, right? So right. like it just, you know, we don't even ask these questions, but undoubtedly these fertility issues that black women have. And again, because we live in a country that treats black women as though we are breeding machines mm -hmm. and that our children are, you know, welfare cheats and that, or you know, worthy of being shot in the street as though they're not human. Mm -hmm. I think we don't often talk about the fact that actually not every black woman can just conceive easily, conceive when she wants to conceive without some assisted reproductive technologies, right? And I also completely hear you when you are working towards your own path and story, you do not want to hear about Gabby Union and MHB have a surrogacy. So what? In fact, I can remember, mm -hmm. I hope she doesn't think I've gone too far, but Gabrielle Union did say to me at one point, she was like, yeah, I remember reading your piece about um, having your second daughter through surrogacy. And I thought, well, that's nice, but don't have anything to do with me. And mm -hmm. then right in her own journey. So I just want to say, I, I, I don't know what your journey will be, um, but I, I do hope that we recognize, and I just think this is so important. This just sucks. It sucks. Yeah. It shouldn't have to be this way. We shouldn't have to suffer embarrassment, lost wages, lost hours, pain, you know, any of it. And we sh certainly shouldn't have to lose our ability to make families in the way that we have a right to make families. It really does legitimately suck. Yeah. yeah. It does. And it sucks the life out of you, like having fibroids. I mean, no pun intended. It really, really does. So yeah. again, you know, I applaud you, Tanika. Thank you so much, Melissa. Like I can, I can talk about this all day long because it just really is something that if, if it's not affecting me, it's affecting my sister. If it's not affecting my sister, it's affecting my mother. You know, I didn't even know my mom had a hysterectomy and I didn't even know she had one because they didn't talk about things like that with their kids. Right. You no, know, she's from the South. You know, I grew up in Alabama. I didn't know what was going on with her personally ever. Yeah. I didn't know why she was in a bad mood or just was having <laughs> right. or just whatever her deal was. I was not, you know, again, that connection as that mother daughter connection was just, just never allowed to be there, you know, in my era of, of being raised. So it was only when I actually decided to do something about my fibroids and start talking about it. That was when she told me that she suffered for years with them and she had a hysterectomy. And then she talked about all the things that happened to her after she had the hysterectomy. And she was very sad that she had had that in the end because she didn't have anyone to give her information. She didn't have a life. The doctors don't really, you know, she came up in the school where you go to the doctor, you're talking about bleeding to whatever they go up, oh, have a hysterectomy. That's what you need yep. to do. Right. And I that UFE, they're not talking about any of these other options that are out there. She had that ignorance led her down a, a path that it didn't necessarily have to lead her down. And I feel like she's had some other health issues, some mental issues mm -hmm. because of making that choice. Yep. And um, we can't, you know, we got to move forward. We can't live like that. And and 
I, I will continue to talk about fibroids until my bloody elevator story and, and, and anything that I could talk about to make sure that this conversation doesn't go away, you know, because like I said, my mom didn't, she didn't have a, a, a forum like this or a platform to really know about any of this information that we're speaking about so candidly now. And, and I will mm-hmm. say there, there's still one thing that, um, Cynthia, you sort of broached it a little bit, but we we didn't even all the way get there. So I'm, I'm sort of feeling like I need I need a Cynthia Bailey ongoing like Zoom Saturday afternoon, the talk, <laughs> right? Like so the girls can come and just sit and say, hey, can we talk about the first period? Hey, can we talk about, you know, the other piece of <laughs> around fibroids is is sexual health, right? So whether you are heterosexual, whether you're queer, whether your body with this uterus that has a fibroid is a is a body presenting as female or is one that is presenting in a in a non-gender conforming way, it affects sex. It affects sexual enjoyment. It affects the capacity for sex in the sense of like if you're bleeding very heavily for weeks, right? Your interest in sex mm-hmm. and even your partner's experience of sex with you. And so that's a whole not, I'm not saying I want to have that conversation right now, <laughs> but I'm saying there are all these other pieces to it that I think, again, people really need some place to go and not feel um, judged. Yes. And, and you know, it's like, you know, when you're going through it, you feel like you're the only person that's going through it in your home. But really, and I kind of touched on it a little bit, whoever you're with, your mate is going through it. Yep. Your children are going through it because I know during, you know, those times where I was like having all this heavy bleeding, I was not a nice person to be around. I was not happy. I didn't feel like doing anything. I didn't want to be bothered with anyone. All I wanted to do was curl up in my bed and watch Lifetime. You know, all I wanted to do and sex. Are you kidding me? Like, even once it was over, once my cycle was over, I was just happy not to be bleeding. I don't even, you know, it's like, it, it just, so much of that, you know, your sex life, you know, I mean, I don't want, that's a whole nother, we, it's a whole nother thing. <laughs> a whole nother thing. <laughs> so, but anyway, but the point is it affects everyone in your house. It affects all the people around you because you're physical and mental, you're just off. You're just not as great as you want to try to be. And, you know, we all want to be great. We're like overachievers. I mean, I see everyone on here is doing their thing. Again, we don't have time for fibroids. And and, and this is this is great. This is great. Keep Absolutely. I just want to add to, um, Melissa, you talked about the sexual health component, the mental health component, as Cynthia has alluded to, like it's another factor that we're not considering. One of our community members this week talked about um, being, I think she was about two months pregnant and losing her baby to a degenerating fibroid. So a fibroid that lost its blood supply, started to die, Mm -hmm. caused so much pain, and then in turn harmed the baby. So it's like, what, you know, what about those women? Like, what is the mental health component that's happening when you are experiencing this year in, year out. Um, so that's a, a whole nother, the talk with Cynthia Bailey and Melissa <laughs> Harris, <right? laughs> that y'all can oh, have. Oh my God, my teen daughter would die. No, I think it should just be Cynthia Bailey. It's okay. She already says I talk too much about it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but for real, look, I, I mean, I just, so let me just underline one more time. And mental health is related to every other aspect of our physical health. Right. So, you know, as you're talking about those stress hormones, all of that, I know I gained about 40 pounds during my, you know, long cycle with fibroids because you couldn't run, you couldn't write. So undoubtedly my heart wasn't as good, my liver wasn't as good, my kidneys weren't as good, right? right. And so it is really all of it. And I just keep thinking about that nasty legislator saying to you, oh, you know, but you're not dying of it. But we are, right? You might have died that week and it might not be the thing that's on your death certificate, but yeah, from the mental to the physical to the sexual, we actually are dying of it. Right, and it's so true, Melissa, let me just quickly share this with you. I, in the height of like when I was dealing with my fibroid issues, I stayed on the baby bump alert. Like people always, because I was always, my stomach was always bigger and swollen. I spent probably most of my time trying to convince everyone that I wasn't pregnant every month and not having these kids that <laughs> because I stayed like, well, Cindy Bailey, 
oh, is there a secret? She looks like she's about four months pregnant. When yeah. I tell you the energy and the time that I had to spend defending the fact, I was like, and then that was another reason why I had to just fess up and come out about it. Yeah. I'm not pregnant and not having, I would have like a hundred kids running around at this point <laughs> on the baby bump alert. I'm right. not pregnant, I have fibroids. And that is why my stomach protrudes out the way it does. And I look like I'm three months pregnant all the time, no matter what I do. Mm -hmm. Is that's just how my stomach looks because I have some two big fibroids inside them that are, are just sucking the life out of me and making yeah. everyone think that I'm pregnant. So again, another reason why I had to come clean because they wouldn't leave me alone about it. I love it. I feel like the, our action items, because people always want action items, right? So we got some action items. Speak your truth. Yes. When you speak it, you better bet you're going to start hearing some other truths. Be in conversations with your yes. sisters about all of it. Support the legislation that yes. is uh, currently working through Congress and support it by calling your senator. If Kamala Harris, if you live in California, you probably don't have to call her. She's on it. But if you don't live in California, call your senators, call your member of Congress, tell them that this really matters. Tell them it matters to women. Tell them it matters to women's partners. Tell them it, it matters to our children. And tell them, in case they don't care about any of that, that it matters to the American workforce. Tell them it matters to whomever so that we can get this done. I just wanna say thank you to both of you, not only for being here and sharing information, but sharing yourselves, being vulnerable in this way, in a digital space on a day like today. Um, is I'm just so appreciative of it. And you just also gotta know, uh, Cynthia ain't the only one praying for you. you. I just have no doubt there's like a whole prayer warrior closet going on Absolutely. now. And um, no matter what that ends up meaning, it's going to be um, some beautiful outcomes for you. So thank you both so much. And thank you to the Black Women's Health Imperative for 38 years of extraordinary work. All right. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Thank you for having me. Uh, great to see you, Melissa. And I'll talk to you soon. Great. Thanks. Bye. Bye.